He's a lovely as far as I'm concerned. That's, I don't I don't see how he could do it. But like, I mean, I teach two nights a week at Don Opossum, and the rest of my time is in Chicago, and I I still don't have time. I don't know how he was like, leading Salam multiple yeah. times today in the masjid and writing that. What, what's his name again? Ahmed Arafat. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's moving to uh, Mecca Center. Oh, is he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. That's so... yeah. Okay. He's great, mashallah. Okay. He's, He's a wonderful good. person. We're good? Okay. Yeah, we had uh, Sheikh Hassan Ali here a few days ago. I love him, man. Oh, I wish, yeah, I wish, he, uh, I wish he stayed. But inshallah, Sheikh Ahmed will be beneficial for them. Yeah, yeah. It's tough, man. You know, Sheikh Tariq a few days ago as well. Programs there. I think he's moving to Bridgeview from Ryan. Yeah, I think I mean, a lot of us swapped. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Forget. All right. All right. Bismillahir Rahman. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Bismillahir Alhamdulillahi wa Salatu wa Salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala Alihi wa Sahbihi Ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, 27th night, we are honored to have Ustad Firas Al Khatib. He holds a BA in history from the University of Illinois, Chicago, and a master's in Middle Eastern studies from the University of Chicago. And he is currently pursuing a PhD in Near Eastern languages and civilizations at the University of Chicago, almost with a focus on Ottoman intellectual history and Islamic legal theory. Alhamdulillah, next month, or in next month or in two months? In a, two, two months. In a few two months, months, inshallah, he will be finished with this PhD. May Allah Ta'ala put barakah in his studies. He is the author of Lost Islamic History, Reclaiming Muslim Civilization from the Past. A few years ago, I took my family for Umrah, and after we performed the tawaf, you know, we had a few extra days in, in Mecca Mukarramah. So I went to the library in Mecca Mukarramah, in, in the Haram. And I noticed there were books on tafsir, on aqida, on history. Then there was a small English section. Guess what book I found in the, in the English section? Like lost Islamic history. He previously taught Islamic history at Universal School in Bridgeview from 2010 to, to till 2015. And he has been teaching at Darul Qasim since 2014. Raise your hand if you have heard of Darul Qasim. Okay. A lot of you should be more aware of this college. I believe it's one of two or three colleges that have been accredited in the United States. And our dear professor, Ustad Firas Al Khatib, teaches several courses in Darul Qasim, and he has a course titled The Islamic Studies Essentials. So before you speak about uh, this top, the topic that you were assigned, Ustad Faraz, if you could please discuss a little bit about Darul Qasim, um, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, okay. um, Darul Qasim, for anyone who doesn't know, it's a uh, licensed college. We have two campuses now, one in Glendale Heights and one in Hoffman States. Uh, we're the only licensed Muslim college in the country that teaches a traditional Islamic curriculum. That our graduates are actually ulama, right? Uh, which is not something that any other institution in America can claim. Alhamdulillah, we just moved into a new office. If you also come visit us if you haven't already, we have I think, almost 100 full, uh, full time students, between 50 and 100 full time students now. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we're, we're doing very well, and all of us who are there are very blessed to have the trip of Sheikh Amin Kulwadiya, who the whole college is his entire vision. These uh, Islamic studies essentials classes designed to teach people the basics of what is fiqh, what is aqidah, how do Muslims interact with the world around them. Uh, everything from there all the way up to that. Right? So you can come to that part everything to teach you Arabic. Well, I'm, well, you'll teach you Arabic. Right? Learn how to read Arabic first, and then we'll come and teach you sort of a nahum balafa and everything like that. Um, before you speak on your topic, if you could also discuss why you wrote this book. Um, because historians make a lot of money. Become a millionaire, which, mashallah, hasn't panned out. Uh, 
Uh, but no, I, I wrote this book because I was teaching uh, Muslim history uh, at a high school, um, and there was no textbook. Right, Muslims on we don't know our history. Uh, part of the reason for this, which I think I'm preaching to the choir here, is that we're not allowed to study history. Right? When we go to college, we have to become doctors and engineers. And this is a little bit of my own background in engineering. For my family, no, I can actually consider this won't be living on welfare for the rest of my life. Um, but uh, there was a gap. It wasn't, you know, there were no books that were written by Muslims for Muslims as an introductory book for Muslim, uh, for Muslim history. So I wrote it 10 years ago. I can rewrite it now. I changed quite a bit of it. Um, but inshallah, it's a khidmah for the Muslim Ummah uh, as a whole. Okay. If you can discuss how Ramadan was understood historically in Muslim civilization and the connection between spiritual strength and material strength, you have 20 to 25 minutes. Oh, uh, I think it, yeah, it was, it was some of them weren't able to hear. Gotcha. Okay. Bismillah. Uh, so, as Ramadan is winding down, mashallah, we're in the last 10 nights, the last few nights of Ramadan, I want to talk about some of the lessons that we can take with us from Ramadan, out of Ramadan into the rest of the year. And obviously the past few months have been very difficult in the Muslim Ummah. Right? And we have it very easy, relatively speaking, right? compared to the level of oppression that they are experiencing. But even from our very privileged position, living in the West, in very comfortable, safe homes, it's still emotionally draining for us to be on a daily basis in HD on your phone, seeing these images that we've been seeing. And every person that has a heart around the world wants to do something about this. And we're constantly looking around, trying to figure out what can we possibly do? Protest, we have awareness, we care, we we all politicians and we do all this kind of stuff, which is great. But we are missing something very important in terms of the way that we engage with the world around us. What we are missing is a uniquely Muslim framework for how we approach Muslim civilization, how we approach Muslim society, how we approach Muslim suffering. We tend to be very obsessed with form, and we focus on the ideal. What I mean by that is that we all look at Muslim history, read any history book, and we look at the past and say, oh, that was great. We had these sultans and these great kings who established Muslim civilization, Muslims were powerful, we had the largest economies, the greatest GDPs, we had the biggest armies that stretched from Spain all the way to the Indian subcontinent, Europe. We're focused on the form. And we have no idea of the framework. What is the framework that allowed for the rise of Muslim civilizations? Such as so this is where the lessons of Ramadan are beneficial for us. So we can gain a little bit of an insight into the way that civilizations were formed in the first place. What did we learn from Ramadan? We learned, you know, obviously, we learned no ibadah, but we learned that we are capable of far more ibadah than we do. The fact that we're all here now, it's past midnight, we're all engaged in all these extra things. We know that we are capable of that in a way that we normally aren't throughout the rest of the year. We engage in self control. Obviously, this is what that is all about. Controlling yourself in from the most basic of the the thing that you need water and exercise control that to us whether you were born or you entered into or in your life for us it's a second nature now right like, even if you don't do that soon enough for the rest of the year you fast a lot right thirty days in a row the first couple of days the caffeine had it's tough but after that. You Sailing, it's not hard, right? We eat isolation, and I want to focus on the last 10 days. The sunnah of the 
of Muhammad is do him to isolate himself in the isolate himself from the rest of society, isolate himself from the world around him. For 10 days in Ramadan. Last year of his life, he did 20 days in Ramadan. This sounds completely counterintuitive. But if you want to fix society, if you want to fix the world, if you want to save the Muslim, you have to isolate yourself from that, from that same world that you want to fix. It sounds like But our example is the Prophet Muhammad Before anything else, before you look at history, I think history is great. You can go look at the Ottoman and the movie. And the, our example is not those people. Our example is the Prophet And nobody had more of a responsibility to the Ummah than the Prophet You don't care more about the Ummah than he did. You're not more concerned for the Ummah than he was. He is. And yet, what did he do? He hated himself. Shut himself off from the rest of the world. If he did that, and his responsibility is exponentially greater than any responsibility that you have today, then that means that his example is something that you should still follow. And this is one of the things that we want to do with us. It teaches us that we are capable of isolating ourselves. We are capable of going to the masjid, preferably not even our home masjid, where you're going to see everyone that you already know. Preferably to isolate yourself in a masjid where you don't know anything at all. It's just purely on the reality. You are focused purely on attracting the blessing of Allah. Now, you take this example. This is the framework. We about framework, right? Ideal and form. This is the framework for what creates a great Muslim civilization. And the examples abound in Muslim civilizations. But I'll just give a couple of examples to, to kind of um, uh, sprinkle these in. That Masjid al Aqsa was occupied, right, during the Crusades around 900 years ago. And obviously, not to compare tragic time periods, it's not fair to do that. But we see today really society and everything like that. It matches the barbarity the Crusaders brought, right? For those who have been to Al Quds, that I've seen it personally. Imagine that message that you've seen, or even if you've seen pictures of it. Imagine that message filled with the blood of Muslims up to your knee. This is the way that the Crusaders described the scene when they entered that message. And they were proud of it too. They were proud of the fact um, they reported this in their own diaries. This is from Muslim sources. Because there were no Muslim sources, because every Muslim was killed. There was no Muslims left alive after the conquest of Al Quds in 1099. Right? So, their sources are talking about how destructive and barbaric and everything is. What was the reaction of Muslims? Right, let's focus on one person in particular who lived in that time. Well, no, Salah al Din. Salah al Din is not part of the story. Who lived at that time, who was in a couple of years before that conquest, was Imam Ghazali. We all know Imam Ghazali, obviously. Hujjat is now one of the greatest. He dies 12 years after Masjid al Aqsa is gone. Imam al Ghazali writes on a number of different topics. He writes on philosophy, he writes on film. The most important book that he ever wrote is a book called Ihya al The Revival of the Religious Sciences. And the emphasis of this book is a multi volume book. We can't really summarize it. But if we want to summarize it, it is to revive the spiritual life of Muslims. This is the impact that Imam al Ghazali had. The impact was not felt only that he died after Masjid al Aqsa was conquered. And Masjid al Aqsa was remained occupied for 80 years after that conquest. But what we have afterwards is the impact of his work, the impact of his emphasis on spirituality, which he was taken from. Prophet Muhammad starts to trickle out in society. You have Nur al-Din 
this Greek sultan who ruled in Syria. He was actually Salah al-Din's boss, a general working under Nur al-Din. Nur al-Din is a, he was a, a pragmatic warrior, he was a pragmatic sultan, he knew about military, he knew about how to, you know, establish a company. Uh, what was the cornerstone of the sultan? You can go to Syria today. I mean, you can't really go to Syria today. But if you were to go to Syria today, you would see that the medallions that he established are still there today. They're still alive and they're still benefiting people today. That was the first thing that he did was to establish education so that Muslims can learn their deen and learn the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Do anything else? Uh, uh, the intention of saying that the member is specifically for Masjid al so this is all Masjid al is still occupied. With the intention of saying we're going to get there eventually, but first we have to establish ourselves where we are. One of the products of that civilization ends up rising up, and we don't get into the history that you can read it read on your own. A fascinating story. But he ends up succeeding Nur al Din Zandi. So al himself actually had no interest in becoming a Sultan. That was not his chosen career path. He wanted to be a alim. He was, you know, stuck in the madness and trying to, to just be a scholar. His uncle pulled him along on a military expedition. His uncle ended up becoming the governor of Egypt and then he ends up inheriting that position. Probably he had no interest in being a ruler. Because of the fact that he established himself spiritually and with the ilm first be a successful ruler. After he started the then he, it was only a few years before Masjid al itself was created. Right? Something that should have had happened decades ago. Uh, material uh, effects on the ground, right? There were millions of Muslims around the Crusader states, and the Crusaders never had an army more than 30,000. The numbers just don't check out. And yet it's still only 80 years from the century. Why? Because they had to establish themselves spiritually first before they did anything. It's not to say that Muslims were not working before that. They were in the immediate aftermath of the conflict of Masjid al-Aqsa. You can imagine the trauma that this has on the Muslims. This is the first time that Masjid al-Aqsa is occupied by anyone but Muslims since Omar al-Qaqtab conquered the city in the aftermath life of the Prophet So immediately afterwards, you had people literally leading protests in the streets of the major cities of civilization. You had people marching in the streets of cities like Baghdad and Damascus, demanding that the Muslim armies do something, demanding boycotts or whatever the 11th century, 12th century, of that was. And yet, nothing happened. It didn't work yet. Because we had to spiritually rectify ourselves before we can accomplish things materially. Salah al Din understood this. Again, if you go to a place today, no one should go there. But if you're an American citizen, it's very easy for you to go. And I know it's like, Excuse I always hear oh, it's dangerous and things like that. The unfortunate reality is that if you're an American, you're going to be very safe. Nobody's going to mess with you, right? And every time I go there, I ask people in Al Quds, what what uh, message do you want me to take back to Muslim? They all say the same thing: tell them to come visit us. We're very isolated. The only people that come visit them usually are Palestinians who are going to visit their families. Anyway, it should be all of us every year. We should be going war. We should be visiting. Anyways, um, to Al-Quds, obviously it's a very historic city. There's historical sites. You're tripping over them. Stuff from the Ottoman era that's like 200, 300 years old. Maintained. It's not One of the things that you'll see in the old city is a place called Al-Khanqa As-Salihiyya. Al-Khanqa As-Salihiyya. This was a spiritual lodge established by who? Al-Din, Al-Khanqa As-Salihiyya, because he had the foresight to understand what establishes a Muslim civilization, what causes a Muslim civilization to be powerful, spiritual power, 
How do you establish spiritual power? You isolation. That's the role of Khanqa. Right? Khanqa is the word that's usually associated with the Indian subcontinent and the Persian land. In the Arab lands, usually the word is Zel. A Zelia in the of a room is called a Zelia. Why is it called a Zelia? Literally, you just go sit in the corner and do your thing and do your ibadah. Spiritual person first. Because the tech kids, these are all just different names in the Muslim world. They're not, you know, beautiful like our massages are. You go to massages in places like Istanbul, you have beautiful, you know, calligraphy everywhere, the, the most beautiful designs. It's really nice. You go to a conference anywhere in the Muslim world, they don't look like that. Why? Because you're supposed to be isolating yourself from the world. You're supposed to be isolating yourself from the beauty of the world. You're supposed to be isolating yourself from anything other than the world. So not a problem. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wait, in And again, he has more responsibility to the ummah than any of us. Another example from the author cases. This is another, uh, another example after a disaster in Muslim civilization, the Ottoman Empire is established after the Mongol conquest. The Mongols make the Crusaders look like the destruction that the Mongols brought in Nawra and Nahar, trans great center of Islamic knowledge, essentially, to this day, they don't have the prestige that they had before that. Besides, obviously, Imam. Of how many other people have the name Al Bukhari before right? So many of them in our history were called Bukhari, Balfi, and after they don't have that. It's a totally horrible conquest. In the aftermath of that, you have the establishment of the Ottoman Empire. And we can, you know, the Ottomans, oh, they're great, they conquered Constantinople and they established these big massages and people were there, you can benefit from it, things like that. Not a lot of people focus on the origin of the Ottomans. Where did the Ottomans come from? The, the founding story of the Ottoman Empire is that the Ottoman is in the Khanqa of his share. So he has a share who trains him in spiritual uh, training, spiritual self-control. He's sitting in the Khanqa of his share, and he has his name one night. Sprouts of the Four rivers come out of his chest, and the branches of the tree kind of blot out the horizons of the world and things like that. He goes to his ship when he wakes up. His ship was known for a dream. He tells the dream and says, What's this all about? He says, From your progeny is going to be a great empire. And this empire is going to conquer the world. And we know that this ends up happening. This is the Ottoman Empire. And my daughter, all future this Ottoman state are going to be the products of a literal and figurative marriage between the political and the spiritual. And then the his is first Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I felt like four microphones is a bit much. <laughs> so when the Ottomans go from being a frontier principality where they're literally guys on horseback who are raiding against the Romans, they start to actually conquer cities and establish this in Roman areas. What's the first thing that the second Ottoman ruler Orhan does? Establishes a madrasa. What does he do to establish a madrasa? He goes and finds the greatest alim of that time that he could find in those lands. It was Dawud Qaisari. The island of both spiritual scientists as well as exoteric scientists. He writes a book in, 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 and he has this one chapter focused on Khilafa. Everyone always talks about Khilafa. If we can only just bring back the Khilafa, it's never going to rain again. It's going to be like rainbows and butterflies all the time. He talks about Khilafa and he talks about what is necessary for a Khilafa. To be established. He said the first thing that you need to do is to establish your spiritual presence. And the example that he gives for this is from the Quran and the usage of the word khilafa in the Quran. Who is associated with the word khilafa in the Quran? Adam, right? 
Right. He takes that ayah and he says that khilafa is not actually associated with Adam. He says because Adam is not specifically given the title of Khalifa. He says who is given the title of Khalifa in the Quran? So think about where Prophet Dawood is in the chronology of the prophets. Right? He's well after obviously Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, Prophet uh, Prophet Adam, he's later into the into the rule of Bani Israel. And what is unique about Prophet Dawood is he combines two forms of authority: spiritual authority, and political authority. Which one comes first? Spiritual authority, because all of the prophets before him had spiritual authority, and that had to be established in the lineage of Prophet before you can establish political authority. He was the first Prophet, and that his son, after him, combines the two into one. So Dawood Qaisari, writing in the, in the 1300s, says this is what Khilafah is. Khilafah has to be established spiritually first, then politically. A century later, you have another Ottoman scholar, Bahrim Abdurrahman. I, I won't talk much about this, I'm not trying to turn this into dissertation. Um, but Abdul also talks about different levels of society. He focuses on this idea of wilaya. Right? Wilaya can be translated into And their responsibility is to uh, uh, take Risala from Allah and disseminate it to society. They have responsibility, they have the low that we have a second level, and that is the ulama. The ulama take that, uh, that sharia that is established by the NBA, and they interpret it, and they spread it, and they, and they establish it in society. Below that, you have the mulu, you have the kings. King's job is to take that Sharia that the Holy Man interpret and establish in society in terms of what it like establishing courts that are in Russia. At the bottom, then, you have individuals. People like Rosie, I don't know if I have to that's the only thing in this room, right? If I do see Rosie, I'm not sure. But we don't, as individuals, we don't have a responsibility at the highest level. So, what is our responsibility? Thank you. 
Uh, I was turned the question around because the question I want to present is things that can be I think that anyone who is not is biased to be to be from that we don't need others to cause us to go out of the world. I don't think that that necessarily causes the neighbor to have a problem. But we don't necessarily need to you know, uh, you know, Jews establishing some kind of prophecy and things like that to say we can do our actions at their own. We should do that in the house, uh, regardless of what anyone else is doing. As far as I'm concerned, everyone else is just um, uh, side characters to just for you. I mean, I already scored um, the political sciences. That's simple. I focus on stuff that already happened. I think that's easy to do with my own school at this point. But yeah, I mean, and I think it's very difficult for any Muslim in the world today to look at the situation, not just in policy, obviously, we have so many different parts of the Muslim world. Uh, it's hard for Muslims not to look at that and say that we need something that needs to change. We need something to that we need to go to the athletics that we need from there. Have the kind of balance to the rest of the reliable policy. And this cycle happens in the right place. It really does mean that a lot of these are the cause of the cyclical nature of this. I didn't feel a whole lot of them know that it should be on the way back. We have a very good one. 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 Corruption in the world, or not, because I use all kinds of opportunities to be 
cyclical nature to most of society. Uh, that, for example, when things are really bad, and he takes a very material approach to it, um, not that he denied the spiritual side of it, but as a historian, he was just focused on the material side, uh, how it manifests in society. Uh, so he talked about how when they establish a civilization. And because they establish a civilization from uh, coming from nothing, they don't really care for the luxuries of society. They don't really care about wasting their time in the palace, chasing, uh, uh, chasing luxuries and, and delights and things like that. And then he says the second generation has a little bit of that toughness of their parents. They lose a little bit of it. The third generation doesn't care about that at all. They're the second generation born in the palace. And they have all the luxuries of the cities, and all they want to do is listen to music all day and not waste their time. And then they're replaced with the first generation of the next, the next dynasty. Um, you can see the same kind of thing happens in Muslim society as a whole. The Ottoman Empire was so powerful and at peace for so long that, you know, Muslims, not just anyone in that kind of a, in that kind of a civilization, kind of takes their eye off the wall a little bit, right? Um, that said, however, when Ataturk did his uh, anti-Islamic reforms, there were ulama and awliya and Muslims in the streets that were disobeying his orders openly, and they're all put in jail. And this is not to say that Muslims at the time of Ataturk or at the time of at any point in time when Muslims are politically weak, everyone doesn't care about spirituality and things. Uh, Mehmet II, uh, uh, um, you know, fulfilling the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad or you're living in the time of a secularist dictatorship of Atatürk, we as Muslims, again, recognize that our najat is not in this world anyways. Our najat is in the Afghan. As long as you are doing your ibadat and you are attaching yourself to Allah, you're not really bothered by what happened. Uh, as I said, some of the greatest ulama in our history in times of Dav is that he lived during the Crusades. Right. And we have great ulama like uh, Muslim Sabri and, uh, um, and uh, Zahid al-Ghafari who were in the time of Atatur. Uh, this is a constant in Muslim history. Is that what Zahid said for us? We have Aman and then his brother? Yes. Like, 
Uh, so the question is, how do you balance isolation with engaging with the world around you? Uh, I would answer tentatively that there is no balance. If somebody, if how we can of us, uh, uh, I spend one fourth of the day doing salawas with my If I saw something, so I can do more. And the guy says, okay. I spend half the night doing salawas with my says, do more. And the guy says, I spend three fourths of the night doing salawas. And the boss of the says, do more. And the guy says, all right, I spend the whole night doing salawas upon you. And the prophet also says that. Right there, you go. There's your balance. Right, the balance is that you should only be focused on that. Everything else will sort itself out. Right, there are again. It goes back to the question of wilaya. It goes back to the question of what is your responsibility in the world. If you are a, a ruler of a Muslim country. itself right the world has its ups and downs but as muslims we're not necessarily concerned with not, i shouldn't say that we're not concerned with obviously we're very concerned i started just by talking about what was happening in Gaza. as muslims we are emotionally attached to that and if you are not emotionally attached to that there's something seriously wrong we have to be able to be the only way to rectify that is to rectify ourselves how do you rectify yourself by following the example of the prophet which is through ice. People at different levels in society that have to do different things have to do those different things. People who engage politically, in Muslim, in, whether it's in, in non-Muslim society or Muslim society, they do have that responsibility and they have a framework in which they can work. But for the vast majority of us, that is not working. So, so that's a very good question. Structures change from time to time. Oh, right. so, so the question is, um, how do we uh, take this blueprint of spirituality and establish it as a, uh, uh, as a civilizational value, if I understand correctly? Um, the, the, the structures and the way the form takes over time changes. So for example, as much as I love history, and I, I can talk here about history and this and that, I don't want anyone to go and read about, um, uh, about crusades and about small and say, okay, well, if we want to liberate Jerusalem today, what we have to do is we need to send an army to Egypt first, and then we need to overthrow the ruler of Egypt, and then once we do that, then we can establish the connection between Egypt and Damascus. Like, the, this, the, the practical application of it changes from time to time. And this is one of the amazing things about Muslim civilization is how flexible it is. That same framework applies in all kinds of different places. It applied in, you know, the whole India, the way that at the very same time that the Ottomans were established in Constantinople was vastly different, the way that the government structure operated. What was common between them was that underlying framework. Um, so that's the interesting thing for Muslims in any particular time, is to take that framework and apply it according to the context of that time. And this is the difference between, if I can go back to talking about Sheikh Amin and Donald Hassan, one of the things that Sheikh Amin talks about quite a bit, content and context. The content is constant. Let me change. The content is the example of the Prophet. The Islamic content. It doesn't matter what time, what place you're living in China a thousand years ago or you're living in Egypt a thousand years from now. The content of Islam is exactly the same. The context is different, and the way that you apply it in society is what you change. Right? So the way that the Ottomans ruled and their 
uh, framework for rulership was very different, for example, from the Abbasids and the Umayyads, fundamentally different. Um, but that's because they were dealing with the context of you know, the aftermath of the Byzantine Empire and things like that. That's where we have a lot of leeway to change things. Um, as long as we're operating within the framework that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam established. Khair, Mr. Kuraz, this is the last question from a sister. You already covered this question a little bit, but uh, can we get spiritual learning on our own studies or do we need a teacher, an academic scholarship? Uh, so academic scholarship, if you're talking to Western academia, if you're interested in your spiritual health, don't go near academia. I mean that sincerely. I don't mean this as a joke or something like that. Like if you don't have... Um, a firm foundation in the Islamic sciences, or at the very least, are very closely connected with the alim that you can go to on a regular basis and ask questions to. Stay far away from the masters of these in Islam. yourself a hafiz. How do you be hafiz? You pick up the Quran, you memorize it, and then you recite it to somebody who's already a hafiz. Right? And that person recited it to somebody before them who recited it to them. Going back to who? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? Uh, you literally cannot call yourself a hafiz if you have not yet recited it to somebody to, to kind of be tested. Right? The same way our um, our fit, our afiwa, our spirituality, all of that goes through this chain of transmission. Uh, so you cannot, well, I, 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 you know, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with picking up. You know, there's a lot of traditions of Ghazali's Ihya al muddin Pick it up and read it. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and it's been very much important. Uh, but if you truly want to, uh, to perfect yourself spiritually, you have to find somebody who's a master of the spiritual sciences who can train you in, in the same way that you do this for everything. You can go read a bunch of medical textbooks. I don't want you operating on me until you get that medical degree. And other doctors have said, you actually know what you're doing. We do this with everything else in our in our lives, right? We don't let people build buildings unless if they have an engineering degree. I don't, it doesn't matter how many engineering books they read. They might be incredible at math and engineering and physics and things like that. We don't let them build buildings. Every other field in the world, we recognize the importance of expertise, except for some scholarship for some reason. That's the one where we're like, no, actually, my opinion that this and that, and I don't want to actually listen to it. Like, no, you need to share. Right? Whether it's for, for the outward sciences or the inward sciences. May Allah put barakah in your time, in your health, in your wealth, in Darul Qasim. May Allah protect you all and your family from all types of harm. And, and uh, bless you and may Allah accept this Ramadan. It was nice to see you all. Please, before you leave, do meet and greet Ustad Saras. Tomorrow, inshallah, my tafsir teacher will be coming, Muhammad Sulaiman, to discuss the tafsir of Surah Al-Bad, 1145 p.m. Take care. I'll see you tomorrow. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.